Okay, so. All right, welcome to the Washington Ethical Society. Good morning, all. Very nice to see you. Those of you who I can see, and very nice to um, welcome everyone. So let me see. Here we are. I am Judy Myers. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the officiant today. We're here again for a hybrid platform. Whether you're on Zoom here in the hall or watching or listening to the recording later, welcome to everyone. We are one community unified across time and space as we gather to affirm our values and commit to a better world. If you're on Zoom, please check the chat for tips, uh, like how to use the closed captioning feature and a welcome from today's Zoom chat usher. Here in the hall, we have assistive listening devices available. Check with the sound team at the back for more information. The Zoom chat will stay open through much of the platform service, closing for the address itself and then reopening. I'll read greetings from our online attendees in just a few moments. So, in-person visitors, please stop by the welcome table after platform to speak to a greeter or to our membership coordinator, Maceo Thomas. Online visitors, we invite you to send an email to Maceo at maceot at ethicalsociety.org. That's M-A-C-E-O-T at ethicalsociety.org. If you're a visitor watching this recording later, this invitation is for you as well. You can fill out a connection form at tiny.cc, excuse me, tiny.cc slash westconnects. I'll now read a few of the greetings that folks have written in the chat. Online friends, while I'm doing that, you might want to get a candle to light during our candle lighting. So let us see what we have. All kinds of fun things in here. Let's see. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Try and go to the top. So, there we go. Mirko Willis says hi from the Willis family. Yay. Laura Desculio says good morning. Sarah Morris, good morning on this exciting day. Yes, indeed. That is wonderful. Adam Limehouse says, um, that uh, good morning. It's a technical comment, so I mean, I'm glad. Okay, anyway, and Dara Miles says, Good morning, everyone. Sarah Morris says, Good morning again. Yay. Adrian says, Good morning. Visited, visiting from Davies UU near Andrews. Welcome. Terrific. Yay. Cynthia Goodman. Good morning. Welcome, Casey. And Sasha Rousseau, I'm going to say good morning. Ileana says good morning, all. And we have lots of great things. Adam Goldberg. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, Casey. Sorry, I can't make it in person. But that's the wonderful thing about this technology is people don't actually have to miss it. Randy Myers says, good morning, all, and welcome to West, KC. Mark Mayer says, welcome, and good morning to all, Abby and John. Good morning from the Dakins. Julie Campbell says, wish I were there to join you in person, but happy to have the Zoom alternative. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Uh, Trish Wheel, while uh, Trish says, another good morning. I hate to obliterate someone's name. It's, uh, Carol Fordonsky. Hello from Carol Fordonsky in Crofton. Welcome, Genevieve McDowell says, beautiful day today. Ann Baker, hello, zooming in from Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens on this lovely morning. Good place to be. Cool, wonderful, <laughs> terrific. 
And uh, Laura Disculio says, wow, Anne, you win. <laughs> okay, so. I know I Okay, so it is good to connect and share this time together. Once you're prepared, I invite you to settle in wherever you are as we continue to gather. Opening words this morning are from James Baldwin. It took many years of vomiting up all the filth I'd been taught about myself and half believed before I was able to walk on the earth as though I had a right to be here. Our opening song today is Here I Am. Good morning, Wes, and especially good morning and official welcome, Casey. It's so wonderful to be working with you, even across the miles and across the digital divide. Here I am, and I'm so grateful that you are as well. This is a song uh, by Brian Adams and Hans Zimmer. Here I am, this is me. There's nowhere else on earth I'd rather be. Mm, here I am, it's me and you. Today we make our dreams come true. It's a new world, a new start. Songs alive. Welcome once again. Each week, as we read our statement of purpose as a reminder of our shared values. If you're interested in taking a turn to read the statement of purpose, you can sign up at tiny.cc slash readSOP. Today's reader is John Pfeiffer. John is a member of the West Board of Trustees the tech team, the chorus, and the troop committee for Wes's Scout BSA Troop 1123. The Washington Ethical Society is a humanistic congregation that affirms the worth of every person. We strive through our relationships to elicit the best in the human spirit. With faith in human goodness, we appreciate each person's unique capacities. We joyfully celebrate together and support each other through life. We nurture a sense of responsibility and reverence for each other and the earth. We warmly invite you to join our community of children and adults as we work for a world where love and justice cross all borders.
Thank you so much, John. As John lights our community candle, I invite those of you with candles at home to light yours and for everyone to join in our candle lighting words. May we kindle within us the warmth of compassion, the light of understanding, and the fire of commitment to build a brighter future for all. Hello. Thank you. I have a story for you this morning. The story is called Room for Everyone, and it is by Naz Khan. The Dala Dala rumbled and roared, and Musa and Dada were off to the shore to feast on fish at the Friday Bazaar by the blue crystal waters of Zanzibar. Soon after zooming past Zucchelsa Street, they saw one old man and his bike with no seat. So the driver honked, pulled to the side, and asked, dear brother, do you need a ride? It's hotter than peppers out there in the sun. Come in. There is room for everyone. But Dada, said Musa, I don't think there's room for that man and that cycle of his. Don't worry, Musa. There's space galore. If you move just a bit, we can make space for more. So in came the man with his sweaty old feet and his bike with no bell and no light and no seat. And after some wiggles and giggles and fun, they made enough room for everyone. Next, they passed the Bagala boats, and a herder appeared with two little goats. So the Dala Dala pulled to the side, and the driver yelled, do you need a ride? It's hotter than peppers out there in the sun. Come in. There's room for everyone. But Dada, asked Musa, can there really be room? Enough room for a cycle, two goats, and me? Of course there is, if we squeeze a bit. We'll make enough room for us all to fit. Oh, this is a little more accurate uh, book than I completely expected to be reading at this time as you squeeze into this space together. And though the seating arrangement was tight, Musa could see that Dada was right. And after a shuffle, a squirm, and a squeeze, they found a small space besides Dada's knees. Onward they went with a honk and a toot till vendors approached with three baskets of fruit. Ah! So they pulled to the side, and as you can guess, Musa cried out and began to protest. Mangoes and melons and parachichi, we don't have the space. Please, listen to me. But up came the baskets of tropical fruits, and down dripped the boot juices on ankles and boots. Everyone wiggled and giggled galore, till somehow they carved out space on the floor. Onward they puttered past palms and sails, till a farmer appeared with four shiny pails, filled with milk all the way to the top. So the Dala Dala came to, the, to a stop. We can't, we mustn't, I do not see where he could possibly sit, Musa cried in despair. But the passengers wiggled, and somewhere, somehow, they made space for the farmer and milk from his cow. The Dala Dala drove past some farms until they saw five mamas with fish in their arms. So the Kanda stuck out his head outside, yelling, sisters, hello, do you need a ride? No, cried Musa, this rickety bench has no room for their fish and this, their ickety stench but the passengers wiggled and squished on the floor and made enough room for the ride to the shore. Six minutes later, <laughs> a farmer was walking with six stinky chickens that wouldn't stop squawking. And right there beside them were several fellas carrying seven contingy umbrellas. Goodness. 
Hop in, someone shouted. Get out of the sun. There's plenty of room for everyone. Musa resisted. These chickens are fat. And seven umbrellas, there's no room for that. Dada insisted, just open the door. So everyone wiggled and giggled galore and eventually found room for more. Soon they were making a turn down the lane where a vendor was carrying eight sugar canes and nine tender coconuts fresh off the tree. What yummy, refreshing, sweet drinks those could be. The passengers shouted, do you need a ride? And as you can guess, Musa worried and cried. This is outrageous. We can't let them in. We're already smushed like sardines in a tin. Though it was clearly a very tight fit, they wouldn't give up, no, they wouldn't quit. So in came the coconuts, tender and sweet, and the sugar canes tangled between people's feet, tickling everyone's toes as they wiggled until even Musa started to giggle. A few minutes later, they stopped for fuel, which happened to be near a diving school where 10 divers were ready to go <laughs> with tanks and suits all ready to go, trying to get in on all the commotion so they could explore the Indian Ocean. But was there room for all of their stuff? Did the Dala Dala have room enough? Though the Dala Dala was packed from top to bottom and front to back, Musa yelled out, come join the fun. We make enough room for everyone. So the swimmers with snorkels and tubes and fins wiggled and giggled and wriggled right in. I think we've all been on that bus, if we've ever been on a bus. Yeah. <laughs> the tires were reeling, spinning and burning, the passengers sweating and twisting and turning, elbow to shoulder, beak to nose, Feathers to feet, udders to toes. What a sight to see, what a comical crew, stuck together like labbity goo. They clunkety clunked like junk in a trunk, so close to a breakdown, kerplunkety plunk. When suddenly all of them heard a screech, a hundala, they'd arrived at the beach. <laughs> Out came 10 swimmers with snorkels and fins, who ran to the ocean and drove right on in. Out came nine coconuts, fresh and tender. Out came the whistling coconut vendor. Out came the eight sticky sweet sugar canes with seven umbrellas for sunshine and rains, six stinky chickens and five piles of fish, four heavy pails full of milk, so delish, three big old baskets of fruit for a treat, two little goats, and one bike with no seat. At last, they had finally reached the blue crystal waters of Ngoe Beach, where Musa and Daddy and everyone could wiggle and giggle under the sun. And that is our story about wiggling and giggling and finding space for all of us. Very sweet, very, very sweet. Let us enter now into the centering time of our platform. Each week, we ring this chime in solidarity with people around the world. As we listen to the chime, let us remember our connection to each other and the world around us. Let us open our hearts to compassion for those who suffer. And let us commit ourselves to the work that calls for our love.
invite you to settle in your seat. Whatever that means for you, maybe it means your butt on the seat and your feet on the floor. Maybe to settle in, you have to stand up. Maybe you need to stretch a little bit, mindful of that you have neighbors. Maybe you need to take a big, deep breath. Maybe you really need to let out a breath. <sighs> it's okay to make some noise when you breathe out. I invite you into a time of meditation, of reflection, of getting settled. I invite you to feel the presence of this moment. I need a little more detail on what I mean by that. Notice that you are in a body. Notice that you are a body. You are a body surrounded by other bodies. Fragile, strong, the same and different to you. Bodies that move through the world how you do or not. Bodies that look like yours or don't. Bodies that run and jump and play or rest and relax and sit. Both, some combination, something else entirely. People who run and walk, people who roll, people who are here physically, and people who are here through the actual magic of technology. Spread your thinking out through the Wi-Fi. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Think about that right now, us here and us not here are connected through electrons that have been taught how to transmit sound and sight to keep us together even when we can't be, to let us be present to one another even when it is not safe or practical to be physically together. Take another deep breath if you like. Think about the connections. Call to mind, if you can, someone in this community who has changed you. Someone who, through love or being a rough edge for you to rub up against, has made you different in some way. Think today about the deep magic if you'll allow me that word, of community, of other people, of being changed and changing with each other, of wiggling and giggling and fitting ourselves together, even when it seems like it doesn't make sense or won't fit. Imagine, if you can for a moment, a world that honors that possibility. A world filled with the beauty of difference in motion, changing and being changed 
all time. Thank you. I'm not a lone wolf, and I never was anything I achieve. I achieve it because I am standing on the shoulders of an infinite many, seen and unseen. I'm not a lone wolf, and I never was anything I achieve. I achieve it because I am riding on a tidal wave of universal longing. I'm dropping the high, I'm claiming the we, I'm feeling the everything inside of me. I'm dropping the mind, I'm claiming the us, cause the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I'm dropping the high, I'm claiming the we, I'm feeling the everything inside of me. I'm dropping the mind, I'm claiming the ours, cause I recognize how connected we are. Every tear that was ever shed, and every prayer that was ever said, and every gesture on every day weaves us into the dancing. This is love's way, oh, every tear that was ever shed, and every prayer that was ever said, and every step on every day leads us into belonging. This is love's I'm way. I'm not alone. I'm claiming the I'm feeling the energy. I am not standing was wonderful <laughs> yes so this morning's reading comes from howard thurman's 1980 commencement address at spelman university there is something in every one of you that waits listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. And if you cannot hear it, you will never find whatever it is for which you are searching. And if you hear it and then do not follow it, it was better that you, never, that you had never been born. You are the only you that has ever lived. Your idiom is the only idiom of its kind in all of existence. And if you cannot hear the sound of the genuine in you, you will all of your life spend your days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. 
There is in you something that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself, and sometimes there is so much traffic going on in your minds, so many different kinds of signals, so many vast impulses floating through your organism that go back thousands of generations long before you were even a thought in the mind of creation. And you are buffeted by these, and in the midst of all this, you have got to find out what your name is. Who are you? How does the sound of the genuine come through to you? The sound of the genuine is flowing through you. Don't be deceived and thrown off by all the noises that are a part even of your dreams, your ambitions, so that you don't hear the sound of the genuine in you, because that is the only true guide that you will ever have. And if you don't have that, you don't have a thing. So some of you may be wondering who that is that's been reading story and meditation. And for anyone who does not know, I am really gratified and excited to introduce today's speaker, Casey Slack, the new senior leader of the Washington Ethical Society for their first platform address in that role. And here is Casey. I find it incredibly obnoxious to introduce myself. When Judy asked me for an introduction, I sat and I thought, and I got on a video call with one of my partners and I said, who am I? What should I tell these people that I have not already told them that I am not going to tell them over the next who knows how many years? About every six months, someone asks me for a new bio for something. I'm on a panel, I have a new job, I have art in a show, and they want to know, who is Casey Slack? The advice I get is always, go back to your last bio, just take that and do it. But I, friends, change a lot. And so each time I struggle, each time I go on Twitter and into all of my various group chats and I say, friends, how would you explain me? <laughs> and the answer is very, pretty wildly, depending on how people know me. One longtime Twitter follower said, I was going to talk about really honest and, uh, what is the word that they use? Really honest conversations about sex, because they know me mostly in the context of my work as a sex educator. They said, but then I remember that you're a clergy person. And I was like, yeah, but they might like that, so we could do that. My favorite version of a personal bio I may have ever written was a one-sentence bio that I wrote as an artist when some of my artwork was hung in a gallery show in Los Angeles. It read simply, Casey Slack is a witch. <laughs> I've tried a lot of things. I spend a lot of time trying to explain who I am and having it wildly misunderstood. One of the first things my wife, Caitlin, remembers noticing about me was that most of the people around me had gotten caught up on one or two details and missed the rest of me. I met Caitlin when I was in seminary. I had been living in California for about a year. I still identified as a woman. I had shoulder length, red brown hair. It was a very different experience than what you're getting right now. <laughs> and I was from Cleveland. I had grown up in the Midwest. And people saw that girl from the Midwest and made a bunch of assumptions about my naivety, 
about my worldliness that were not particularly related to who I am as a person. They missed, though it was in their face, my depth of knowledge about hip hop, for example, because those things did not go together in their minds. I went to a day party in San Francisco with a friend of mine, and upon learning that I was from Cleveland, a random gay man I was hanging out with went, oh honey, you got out, and hugged me, and I went, I came to school? <laughs> People make these assumptions about who we are based on one or two facts. You describe yourself in a certain way or are required to describe yourself in a certain way. And people get stuck on that fact. You work in finance, so of course you are a greedy capitalist. Not always. You're a sociology professor, so of course you are progressive. Mm, not always. <laughs> you lived this place or live this place, so you must do this, that, and the other. This is a problem that particularly plagued me during my six years as a minister in Los Angeles. Turns out that if you look like me and are my age and you go to a party in Los Angeles, people think that you would like to be an actor, that you would like to be in music, that you are a professional artist that way. And while I would take myself to be a professional artist, this is art. I'm not an artist like that, and I never had an interest in working in the industry, and that was baffling to most of my peers and almost everybody else, actually. My time as a hospital chaplain was marked by nearly daily comments from patients that I should be a makeup artist. <laughs> I have a whole master's degree. Yeah, but don't you need a job? This is my job. Okay. I think a lot about an introductory sociology course that I took in undergrad in which one of our assignments was to create a Facebook page for someone else. To think about social media, which was newer then than it is now, as a way that people are telling you a story about who they are. The ways that we present ourselves in a variety of contexts, deciding whether we will be people who, as far as Facebook knows, have never touched alcohol because we're a professional, or were my little cousin who turned 20 and took five shots on a Facebook live stream. Choices. Choices abound about how we choose to display ourselves to the world, but it gets hard to send the signals that mean what you mean, especially when the language of the world, how people are used to talking, the scripts of the story that exist don't really include how you do things. Eventually, I ran into a quote from Audre Lorde that has changed my life. She wrote, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. So let me rewind just a little bit. I arrived in the political science department at Case Western Reserve University after about a year and a half of floundering as a pre-med biochemistry major. In that year and a half, I had an emotional breakdown and repeatedly realized that I was not as prepared for any of this as I had thought I was, or as the people around me were. I wasn't the top of my class in high school, but I got A's easily if I tried at all. I was in every AP class available to me, but in my high school, that was two. 
and everyone around me had a year worth of college credits made out of AP classes. I went to chemistry class and everyone around me got three weeks of review and I got one class of review and was never able to catch up. For a long time, I told myself that I wasn't able to, my brain just didn't work that way. But over time, I've realized that if I had really, really wanted to, I could have figured it out, but I wasn't given the resources that everybody else had. I didn't know how to study. I didn't know all of the tricks of college that my peers did. My father never finished college. My mom went when she was in her late 20s. My grandparents never finished high school. The first time I met someone who told me about his grandfather's PhD thesis, I have to confess I was confused. It hadn't occurred to me that anybody had a grandfather who had been to graduate school, of course. But it hadn't occurred to me because that wasn't what was true where I was from. So I start in the political science department after a year and a half of being basically brushed off in the harder sciences. Told once, in fact, that I would never go to graduate school and that I should focus on finding a husband, a thing that I never did. So I arrived in the political science department and on the first day of class, the practice in the political science department was to hand out index cards to each student. And the professor would say, write down your name, your major, what year of school you're in. And in this case, one interesting thing about your hometown. Now, <laughs> it's a complicated question for a lot of people for me at that time particularly. My hometown is an identity crisis. <laughs> my hometown is made of strip malls that were developed and then abandoned. It is made of developments of ticky tacky, exactly the same houses that nobody lives in. Next to the trailer park that everybody lives in, next to some houses that people have lived in for as long as my family has been there, which is since the late 50s. When I was a teenager, our sports teams were bad at everything. <laughs> and so when inevitably we were losing a basketball game and the other team's fans started taunting us, the only response we ever had was, we've got Walmart. <laughs> And so I wrote, the interesting thing about Streetsboro is that there is nothing interesting about Streetsboro. And my professor, Joe White, who was at the time one of the foremost experts on healthcare policy in the country, who had left Brookings to come and teach us for some reason, pulled me aside after class and said, what the hell is this? What, the most interesting thing about where I'm from is that nothing's interesting about it. No, don't talk about yourself that way. You may not live there anymore. You may not ever live there again. But that place is part of you. Don't talk about yourself that way. One of the things I have learned as I have been trying to study some about ethical culture before I began my formal training in ethical culture is that one of Adler's main principles was human worth and uniqueness. All people are taken to have inherent worth, not dependent on the value of what they do or where they're from, what they look like or how they move. That everybody is deserving of respect and dignity and that their unique gifts are to be encouraged and celebrated. 
Weirdly enough, the first place that I learned that might have been in the political science department at Case Western Reserve University. Who knew? Between Joe White, who was the chair of the department, and Alex Lamus, who was my closest mentor, I learned to believe that I could do things, that I had stuff to say that was worth hearing. When I failed to write my senior thesis and then had a second senior year, Joe White sat me down and said, listen, if you need to come into my office and have me stare at you while you write, I will do that. I emailed him upon learning that I would be moving here. The sort of weird miracle of life that what set out to be a career in politics turned into a career in not that, but here. He is delighted. On the way, I started attending a Unitarian Universalist congregation in Cleveland, which is one of the other places that I really learned that all of who I am, all of these pieces that don't seem to make sense together to other people, was not only okay, but great. I showed up sort of by accident, having meant to get involved in Unitarian Universalism since I was 13 years old, but having a sort of natural aversion to church or anything like it after, you know, coercive saving and a lot of other things that we don't have time for right now. I went because my roommate at the time, someone I had met working for the Ohio Democratic Party, became their membership coordinator. And she said, Casey, I think these people are hippies. I cannot go there by myself. She, a good Boston Catholic, she still a lifelong political operative. I think these people are hippies. Can you come with me? I was like, yeah, that sounds like my jam. Let's go. Six months later, she had returned to Boston. And I was on the Sunday services team. I got asked to be part of the Sunday services team, and then very quickly asked to do a service myself. What? I was 23, maybe. I didn't think I knew anything yet. But I came up with a service. I called it Sonder and Beyond. So Sonder is a fake word you know, unlike all of those organically grown tree-based words. Sonder is an intentionally created word from the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows, which used to be a Tumblr page and is now a website. Here's the definition. The realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own, populated with their own ambitions, friends, routines, worries, and inherited craziness. An epic story that continues invisibly around you like an anthill sprawling deep underground with elaborate passageways to thousands of other lives that you will never know existed, in which you might appear only once as an extra sipping coffee in the background as a blur of traffic passing on the highway, as a lighted window at dusk. I talked about how my work then as a patient advocate at an abortion clinic let me really experience this brief moment in somebody else's life. Let me get a sense of how much depth there was in people who otherwise would have just been passersby. How deeply entangled people's lives are with each other and also how invisible that is to most of us most of the time. Do you ever have that experience where you see a car that looks like yours or 
an outfit that looks like yours or a mask that looks like yours, and you think, wait, hold on. In my family, often what we would do when we saw cars that looked like ours, we'd be like, oh, it's us, later. <laughs> or before, I don't know. I think about that a lot when I'm in a new place, when I'm driving or walking around or on the bus the way we are background noise to each other, but also whole deep stories. One of my favorite things about the work that I do is getting to experience deep stories, people's wrestling with the things that matter most in life. At the time that I gave this first service, I was really into young adult author John Green, who continues to be somebody I like quite a lot. His TikToks are the existential crisis that I am always having just in another person. In his book, Paper Towns, he wrote, it is easy to forget how full the world is of people, full to bursting, and each of them imaginable and consistently miss imagined. I think the past couple of years have really underscored how easy it is to forget how many other people there are, how real they are, because no matter how magic the internet is, a person who is not physically with you does not register to your brain quite the same way. A person who you can shut your laptop on is very different from a person directly in front of you who will continue to talk. We go about the world, all of these stories, and a lot of us have internal stories that are a little inflated, right? We are each the hero of our own epic adventure. Me too, don't worry about it. That's normal, it's okay, it's actually probably necessary to survival. But we must remember that everybody is just people. Each and every person is just somebody. This means that the most power, I'm gonna gesture this direction, the most powerful people in the country are just people and Everybody living on the street outside is just somebody, too. It means that the people who think they are the grandest, oh, they all still go to the bathroom. And the people we think are the least, the people we get used to walking past, the people we are not ready to encounter, are full people with stories that are weirder, more complicated, and more beautiful than we will ever be able to completely know. Over time, I have explained myself in a bunch of ways, trying to fit as much of who I am into a brief description. Sometimes it's just a list of identities. I tire of this form of identification, but queer, non-binary, non-monogamous, white, race traitor, rust belt femme, etc. Right now, my personal Twitter bio begins trying to do something else and ends extra tired, extra tired. Various bios on professional websites and on the apps that I use to find new friends and people to date frame me in various ways. Sometimes those are meant to be welcoming. Those are meant to say, hey, come know me, everybody. And sometimes they are not meant to be so welcoming. Sometimes they are meant to say, you, but not you. Yes, no. To get through some routine conversations without having to have them. So when I think about this sort of identity creation, I think about 
what it's like for us to start together. What it's like for me to say, hey, here's who I am, and for you to say, hey, here's who we are, but also I am, which is complicated. And for us to then turn to the outside world, as it were, and say, here is who we are. This is what we do. One of the principles that was agreed upon by the original set of ethical societies was the belief that self-reform should go in lockstep with social reform. So if we look outside and what we say is we want to change you, this doesn't fit with the existing principles and also, friends, it does not work. The pattern of colonialism in American thought, in Western thought, if you will, tells us that we should go help those other people. But you have to help yourself first. Both in the sense of if you are on an airplane and the oxygen goes out, you put that on for yourself first. And in the sense that if you try to encounter people without having spent time encountering yourself, you will not know what to make of them. You can think about it as normed versus unnormed becomings. Not a strict binary. What is? You can think about it as some of us, and really all of us in certain situations, get to learn about ourselves as normal, right? get to be the default character in the video game, the book, the textbook. And others of us have to learn about ourselves kind of sideways, right? Some of us are American history and some of us are special topics. Some of us are political science 101 and some of us are women in politics. Some of us are LGBT people in politics. Some of us are black politics. And on and on and on. There are parallel processes that we have to undergo in order to be able to encounter each other as we would like to. And not just as we would like to, friends, as the world needs us to as our full becoming demands of us. Where we are normed, in me a lot of this is in whiteness, we have to learn to move that lens aside. We have to learn to see how, for example, whiteness has been produced in us. That it is not simply, I arrived, I had a skin tone, ta-da. That things happened that pulled you and your family into this idea that unless you are literally a descendant of the crown of some, some Western European country, somewhere along the way, somebody included you in something that was not for you initially. My family is predominantly from Eastern Europe. My grandmother spoke fluent Polish. My grandfather spoke Czech. My father speaks neither. One of the lessons of my living in my body as myself is realizing that losing that language, a thing my grandparents did on purpose so that their children could be white, caused harm that, oh, I hope my dad doesn't watch this, eh, made him violent. We can see around the country and around the world right now the damage that becoming white, becoming European even, losing your sense of personal identity has caused to so many people. The way in which the desire to protect the power that you were really only granted by some king at some point, by some pretend king at another point, that holding on to that makes us brittle, makes us likely to hurt each other. We can see it in big ways, but it's present in little ways. 
where we are not normed, where we are outside, where we are a special topic. And most of us are at least one special topic. Eventually, if nothing else, being elderly also makes you a special topic. Where we are those things is where that quote from Baldwin comes in. Years of vomiting up all the filth that I had been taught about myself and half believed before I was able to walk on this earth as though I had a right to be there. We need to work through ourselves and each other so that when somebody who shows up on a Sunday morning has a different idea about when they should clap or if they should make noise in response to the speaker or maybe if they should dance, that we can welcome people in all of who they are with all of who we are. The point is not and should never be that we become a room full of Casey's. Dear God, please no. <laughs> I am enough. This is plenty. <laughs> but instead that we are a Casey and a Judy and a Julie and a John and a Maceo and some people we've never met yet. There is this intense beauty and creative possibility in where the ways we are not like each other, the ways we have not had each other's lives, make this beautiful, creative, new thing possible. We have a lot of potential to make something new and beautiful not just because we are at a beginning, but because the world is at a breaking place. Because in the broken places, you can choose to dissolve, you can choose to make a weapon, or you can find something beautiful and put it back together. Maybe not how it was, perhaps, Avoid putting it back together how it was. But in some new, beautiful way. My current favorite piece of art in the Cleveland Museum of Art is a Korean piece that uses the Japanese technique of kintsugi, which is gold lacquer used to put pots back together. The artist has traveled around to various pottery studios and collected fragments of different broken pots. And then, with gold lacquer, pieced them together into a large pottery object of no particular shape. When we visited the art museum in Cleveland with my parents, I stood in front of this piece of art and thought, that's it. That's my whole belief system in a, in a pottery. My father came over and said, what's that supposed to be? And it was a perfect reflection, both of our relationship and of the differences in how we see the world. I don't think it needs to be anything we've seen before. I think maybe it's better if we haven't. And as much as I have spent my life defining myself in opposition to who and where I'm from, this summer I visited my family in Ohio and we had a camp out. And I realized that I am the same guy that all of my relatives are. The longer I am on testosterone, the more I look like the men in my family. I stand like them. I talk like them. I am like them in a really fundamental way, even though we don't necessarily think or live the same way. We super don't live the same way. <laughs> you don't get to be anywhere without where you used to be. You are made up of everybody, everybody, everybody you have ever known, even the people who have been complicated, perhaps especially those people. 
There is a picture I showed Caitlin recently of my grandfather, my grandfather who passed right before I moved to California nine years ago. In it, he is leaning on the porch at my grandparents' house. He is wearing work pants and a tank top. He's kind of standing like this. And when I showed Caitlin that picture, I was wearing work pants and a tank top. And I handed Caitlin my phone and I leaned against the counter like this. I am them in ways I am still exploring. I am all of the things I have been. I am from nowhere. I am from somewhere. And so are you. If you've been here in this room for decades, not the whole time, <laughs> you've been coming to this place your whole life, or today's the first time. If you are deeply entrenched in ethical culture or are really not sure what that is. If you moved across the country twice or never, you are made of all these different things and it makes you unique, beautiful, and glorious. You have been handed some experiences. You have chosen some that maybe did not go how you expected. And what you get to do is rearrange those pieces however you see fit. That is a big task. You don't have to do it alone. That's why we do this sort of thing. It's why we come together and meet each other and say, oh, I have a broken fragment kind of like that. What have you done with yours? Oh, that's interesting. Or what have you done with yours? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I will not be doing that. Virginia Woolf wrote that you get to arrange whatever pieces come your way. And as we begin becoming together deeply, I hope that we will choose to arrange the pieces of who we are in a way that draws people in, that brings people's curiosity. And I don't mean new people necessarily, though that would be nice, but that brings our curiosity to one another, that lets us each be as we are says to you, you know what, if I wanted to dye my hair whatever color, I could do that. And if what I want to do is wear beige all the time, I can also do that. If I feel moved by something, I can say yes during platform. Or not, if that's what I like. If I feel moved by the music, I can dance. No or not, if that's not what you like. And we can find joy in each other's differing expressions. We can find beauty in how complicated we all are. This is a space where we hold together things that feel like they may not make sense. Where we do community with whoever shows up. It is a great adventure it is an art project. And friends, Casey Slack is a witch. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Casey. After some music, we'll have community sharing. And I'm sure that folks will have plenty to say. When you can write into the chat or speak into the microphone and what resonated with you in this platform, you can share that. In this time between, you might prepare by reflecting on a personal experience or an activity at Wes that illustrates the values we're lifting up today. As we contemplate, rest, and reflect, 
let us experience the beauty of the musical response. The song is a call and response, and I'd like to invite you to echo each of the lines I sing. Freedom is my birthright. Freedom is my birthright. I was born in freedom. I must grow in freedom. Claim my freedom now. Mm, freedom is your birthright. Freedom is your This is the time when we add our voices to the morning, sharing our reflections on the platform or what resonates in our own lives. For our online participants, I invite you to share in the Zoom chat or in the comments if you're watching this recording later. I'll start with some of the Zoom comments and we'll accept some comments at the microphone from in-person attendees in the middle and then return to our Zoom participants in the end. So let's have a look at the chat. And folks can um, come if you want to, to wait you know, um, with some social distancing. Um, but let's see what's in the chat here. Good. It will behave. Um, all righty. So, Trish Wheel get, gave us resounding virtual applause. Thank you so much, Casey. Adam Limehouse says, that was positively delightful. Thank you, Casey. Joe says, great platform. Thank you, Casey. And 
Trish reemphasizes. So just want to say that this talk was outstanding and deeply inspiring. And I see that we have at least three people who want to come up uh, in person. And so let us go ahead and uh, you can introduce yourself and um, let us know what Good you morning. Have to say. I'm Randy Best. And on behalf of the American Ethical Union, I'm Dean of Leader Training. I want to welcome KC uh, to the Washington Ethical Society. And also welcome as your colleague from the Northern Virginia Ethical Society. So glad to be here. Oh, good morning, Jeff B. Hall here. Casey, welcome to Wes. You did a really nice job with your platform. I look forward to future ones. When you start, started talking about people making assumptions, I was reminded of something that happened in my childhood when uh, I was 12 years old. My family moved from suburban New York City to Waseca, Minnesota. Uh, Waseca is about 60 miles south of um, the Twin Cities on I-35, and then you go 14 miles west. Uh, so it's really out in the middle of nowhere. And as soon as I said I was from New York, I'm sure they made several assumptions that I was some sort of leather-clad tough from uh, West Side Story or the uh, Blackboard Jungle, you know, somebody who says, hey, you got a problem with me? We don't do that when I come from. I was out on Long Island. And in case you don't know that, it's Lawn, L-A-W-N, G-U-Y, L-A-N-D. I'm going to meet you at the corner of Toity Toyd and Toyd in Brooklyn, and I am going to bound you into a pulp. Uh, I have I've consider myself widely traveled, and I've never met anybody who speaks that way. So I guess the old saying is that um, if you meet somebody for the first time, or even if it's somebody you disagree with, you know, try, try walking a mile in their shoes. Because if you do that, two things will happen. First, you'll be a mile away, and you'll also have their shoes. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Sarah, and I haven't been in this building for a while, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. <laughs> Good to see everybody. Um, I guess what I wanted to say is I was reflecting on where I come from, uh, which is I was born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma area. And uh, recently at one of my pre-retirement gatherings at work, um, I just recently retired, my friend Glenn goes, from Tulsa to Tacoma Park. And for what that meant to him was the place in, because we'd been talking about it a lot, was a place in Tulsa where we burnt down an entire neighborhood and killed, I don't know how many murdered, how many uh, African-American people. And everybody always wants to know if I knew anything about it. And I did not. Um, my mother vaguely said something about there being a riot. Uh, and, and then Tacoma Park, the image is, that place is full of hippies. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, you know nonprofit people whose hearts are on their sleeves and so forth. And it's really, it's so much more complicated than that. And I guess what I want to really say, because I would, be very welcome to how you might help me, is so I'm coming on a two-week trip to Tulsa and to hang out with my dear girlfriends who are just like, uh, very much like me, you know, they're like uh, way liberal, uh, way left, um, but they, one of the outings is going to be an, a restaurant event in Greenwood which is the 
the area that was burnt down and now it's all gorgeous uh, in large thanks to University of Tulsa and the good people there. But it's, it's gleaming restaurants and the uh, Drillers Baseball Park and it's just so nice. And uh, one of my friends said, and we're so proud in this ultra red state, we have managed to get reconciliation payments coming to the few surviving families of the Greenwood Massacre. And my thing is, I'm just trying to get in a place to just go and enjoy your friends. Like, don't give a lecture about white liberals, uh, but it, it, it's kind of hard. It, re it really is. It's a, it's a dissonance. But I had the same experience in Tacoma Park uh, on occasion, too, that I could talk about. Uh, but the last thing I would say is living in ultra red, pretty mean Oklahoma. Uh, it was the first time I became a clinic, abortion clinic escort. It was when I first began to be involved in domestic violence, which I continued when I moved to Kansas, uh, another red, red state that's kind of come out differently lately. Uh, but the upcoming trip is loaded for me. And also because my family home that I was born in and raised in, we've had to sell and it belongs to someone else. There's another family in it. I can't go there. Um, so anyway, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say, except for that there's, there's lasting impressions of where you are and you carry them with you, even as you know it should be interrogated. Wow, this is beautiful to see you all. This is the first time I've been here, I guess since the pandemic. First, Casey, I'd love to welcome you. I'm Eileen Rubenstein. Um, I've been a member for about 30 or so years. I um, met my husband here and anyway, um, we are going, Dan and I, my husband and I are going through a big transition in our lives. And um, it's one of the reasons I really wanted to be here because you're my community. And although I haven't seen you for a while, I need centering. We just moved to senior uh, living, an active senior community that's practically down the street, uh, Connecticut, just north of East West Highway in Chevy Chase. And I'm hoping we're gonna be here a lot more often. But this move has been very difficult. Uh, we're moving from a very large condo to a very, very small apartment. Um, we need help. And um, we need help in continuing to shovel out the stuff in our condos so we can get it on the market and get that money. And we're gonna need help helping us organize our new place. And um, I'm putting this out there for those of you in the community who can. One of my problems right now is I still do not have internet. So um, the directory has got the right phone numbers and until we have internet, that's one way of contacting us. And just, ah, oh, this is one of the most beautiful sights that I can see. And I'm really excited to get to know you better, Casey. I just discovered my brother and his family were visiting from Israel and we got some family together and got some healing in the family together, which was really great and discovered that one of my young cousins is trans, um, has recently uh, grew up as a boy and announced that, that he is now Jade, a, a female. Um, and I don't really know him, and I don't know because they're in Baltimore if I'll get to meet him, but 
the understanding, getting all of this. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for anyone who can help us in this move. Oh, and for those of you, Ross and Judy, who are doing, we have furniture and household goods that we would love to see given to people who can use it. Thank you. And again, welcome. Hello, um, my name is Scottney Young, um, and this is only my second time here. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, um, and I have been searching for a while for a community that I could resonate with and connect with, and um, you know, just seeing Casey and your your um, talk today, your platform today, it was it was really kismet to be here. Um, I'm also a sex educator, <laughs> so I was really excited to hear that. Um, and even to thinking about, you know, when I met my husband, my now husband, and he told me his grandparents had master's degrees, I was like, I didn't think colleges were existed back then. <laughs> um, but just really, and then being here and, and not knowing how, this is journey, by the way, <laughs> not knowing how, um, you know what the what the culture is and and how uh how to respond or or go through all of the the different rituals that you have and that you share together the ceremonies um and just having your message of that however we want to do it is is welcome um was really meaningful to me so thank you Hi, I'm Sue Jacobson. Welcome, Casey. I am thrilled that you are a new senior leader. And I say that having been at WES since 1977 and have seen a lot of leaders and having grown up in ethical culture, seeing leaders in Westchester and New York and whatever. And I am thrilled. I loved your platform. I love the concept of you see someone passing on the street, realize they have a full life. We don't always think of every person we pass and whatever. And um, a cousin, well, actually, it's my cousin's granddaughter, but someone I'm very close to who I've known since I held her as an infant in my arms, and she's now 20. I'm sorry, they are now 29. I have to get used to the change. But in the last couple of years, they announced that they no longer saw themselves as she, they saw themselves as they. And they did the most beautiful wedding ceremony I've ever been to for their sister and her wife a couple of years ago. And so this is very exciting and it's wonderful to be back in the building. I've only been here a few times since COVID. Years ago, I was here religiously every Sunday. And um, so it's good to be back and I will try and get here more Sunday mornings. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Levi. My pronouns are they, them. I have been coming to West since I was born, and many of the faces I'm seeing today have known me since then. Um, and growing up in a community like this has been an incredibly, an incredible privilege. Um, growing up in a space where I can be whoever I decide to be that day. And knowing that Casey is coming into a community that can provide that is heartwarming. And I want to say that this, I think, is the first time that the hall has been this full since before the pandemic. At one point, we were at two platform services a morning. And now seeing everyone filling the seats is making me very emotional. and. It's really lovely to see everyone today. Welcome.
So given the fact that I have the mic, I get to um, uh, be able to have my own comment. Thank you, that, that was delightful. And the thing that I've gotten um, most about Casey, the, the thing that encapsulates as much as possible is something that you um, said a couple of times in the talks that you did give that says, wait, you can do that? that pretty much. So thank you all for your thoughts and comments and questions. Um, so uh, thank you to everyone who has shared their thoughts and attention. Just as we share our perspectives in this community, and we do, so too, <laughs> so too do we share our resources and gifts. Here at West, we split all undesignated gifts in the Sunday collection between our operating budget and a fund dedicated to justice and compassion. This month, the fund that we are sharing half of the offering with is Family and Friends of Incarcerated People. FFOIP is an organization whose primary mission is to foster community support that effectively meets the needs of today's at-risk children and families of those incarcerated. It operates solely to promote charity, literacy, public safety, and to avoid intergenerational incarceration. FFOIP serves DC area children of the incarcerated and at-risk youth by engaging them in social, cultural, and youth development activities through various projects, programs, and events. And one of the upcoming events uh, next Saturday is their annual um, community program used to be a picnic. I'm not sure if it's a picnic or not, but we, Wes has often uh, contributed to their school supplies, um, donations. Anyway, they definitely believe in the concept that it takes a village to raise a child. So let's all take a moment to prepare to respond to the invitation to generosity. For those who are able to respond, we want to make it as easy as possible by offering a full menu of options. Um, if you're someone who gives by text, the number for that is 202-335-1885. And that number is on the uh, slide on Zoom and in the hall here. Um, Another option is to go online to the donate button on Wes's website, ethicalsociety.org. And you can place cash or a check in the basket at the back of the hall on your way out. And you can always send a check by mail. We, we do still accept those. So thank you for your generosity. And now we'll now receive your gifts of Gifts and the Gift of Music.
Thank you so much to the many people who helped to create this morning's time together. Thank you to our staff, including Casey, and there are Miles, Robin Kravitz, Maceo Thomas, and Tom Hutton. Thank you to interim music coordinator, Leah Morris, for today's music selections. Thank you also to John and Abby Dakin, who created our slides. Thank you to stage manager, Kate Lang, Zoom chat usher, Joe Klein, and tech team members, Denise Howell, Patrick McNeely, and John Pfeiffer. Thank you to the in-person greeters, Shayla Bocum and Donna Taylor, and Joe London, who will host the West Coffee Hour after platform. At the conclusion of the platform, please join us for social hour in person around uh, the foyer and on the patio, or virtual coffee hour on Zoom. To get to virtual coffee hour after closing words, point your browser to tiny.cc slash West Coffee Hour. Thanks to those also to those who are leading and supporting our work in the weeks to come. You can find information uh, about opportunities to connect in the Sunday links or news and notes emails and on the calendar page of Wes's website. The West Chorus is gearing up to provide the music for the opening Sunday platform on September 18th. Yes, in person. The chorus rehearses here, masked, in the main hall on Wednesdays from 7.30 to 9 p.m., though there won't be a rehearsal on the 24th. The chorus is open to everyone, so if you enjoy singing or think you might enjoy singing, please contact the current ringleader, who I think, oh yes, he is there, Perry Bider. Uh, you can also reach out to Leah Morris to set up an online one-on-one -on -one voice coaching session. Registration for, uh, registration is now open for Wes's Sunday Ethical Education for Kids, or SEEK program. This week, West members have gotten a series of emails introducing you to the SEEK team. We're now recruiting volunteers for teaching teams and the SEEK team. You do not need to be a parent or you do not need to be a parent to volunteer. And this is a great way to get involved in the community. If you're interested in helping SEEK flourish, please email Andara at Andara, Andara M, N-D-A-R-A-M, at ethicalsociety.org. To attend platform in person, please RSVP at tiny.cc slash platform reservation. You will need to bring your vaccination card or a picture of it, or you can tune in by, to tune in by Zoom as we continue to with hybrid platforms for the foreseeable, free, oof, foreseeable future. The virtual meeting of the biology reading group takes place at 1 p.m. today via Zoom. Check the website for information on that and other upcoming events. For now, let me thank you all for being part of Platform today and invite you to join in on our closing song Love is the water. Love is the water that wears down the rock. Love is the water that wears down the rock. Love is a power that won't be stopped. Love is the water that wears down the rock. You say your heart's been turned to stone. You say you want to be left alone. You say love only made you weep and moan. But let me tell you something that you know in your bones. Love is the water that wears down the rock. Love is the water that wears down the rock. Love is a power that won't be stopped. Love is the water that wears down the rock. Mm. You say your soul feels like a dry river bed. Stop waiting for the water long ago, you say. 
You better pray all night Oh, the rain instead Love comes like a tidal wave Over your head Love is the water that wears down the rock Love is the water that wears down the rock Love is the power that won't be stopped Love is the water that wears down the rock You say waiting for love takes too long It throws a sharp mind, weakens a strong Well, you may be right, but you may be wrong Cause love can make a mountain come tumbling down Love is the water that wears down the rock Love is the water that wears down the rock. It's a power. Love is a power that won't be stopped. Love is the water that wears down the rock. A river washes over every soul in the land. Put your feet in the gravel. Get some mud in your hands. Cause nothing can stand against the love's command. Every boulder turns into a grain of sand. One more time. Love is the water that wears down the rock. Love is the water that wears down the rock. It's a power. Love is the power that won't be stopped. I'm telling you, love is the water that wears down the rock. We finish. Love is the water that wears down the rock. Delightful. A few brief reminders before we leave. If you're new to our community, please send an email to our membership coordinator, Maceo Thomas, and introduce yourself. To reach virtual coffee hour, point your browser to tiny.cc slash Wes Coffee Hour. And now I invite you to join me in our closing words for the month. Let us go into the week ahead with compassion, understanding, and commitment, inspiring and being inspired to ethical living for our hearts and for our quest for a better world. And again, thank you all for joining today's platform. We look forward to connecting with you again soon. Welcome, Cake. <laughs>